Thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to be here. As I said, um, I'm a clinical psychologist. I've been working in the field of addiction since, um, I guess, 1991. And the very first project on which I ever worked was a project using community reinforcement approach um, at um, a homeless shelter here in Albuquerque. So um, have about 30 years experience with that and and its sister uh, model for working with families called CRAFT, which will be another day. I wanna just take the opportunity to give you a, a very limited exposure to community reinforcement and adolescent community reinforcement because there is a lot of depth to these models and um, I just like to get you excited about them and then Maybe you um, will be interested in going out and finding some more information. There are trainings in depth on both of these models throughout the state, in part because both of these models really were refined at the University of New Mexico. So the objectives for today is that at the end of this presentation, I, I really would like you to understand what's the theoretical model for the community reinforcement approach. And this is important to me, especially because I think it makes it helps to make sense of why we choose to do some of the things we do with regard to interactions with patients using this model. I also am hopeful that by the end of this presentation, you all will be able to describe what are the core components of CRA. And they are fairly straightforward and not too many of them. So I'm optimistic that that, that will occur. And then finally, um, I would like you all to be able to describe what sort of modifications we see made to community reinforcement model, specifically when it's utilized with adolescent or transitional age patients. So just a brief history, it, the community reinforcement approach really is a blending of operant conditioning and social learning. And so what does that mean? Well, operant model is actually B.F. Skinner and very simply stated, it's that a behavior that is reinforced tends to be repeated and a behavior that is not reinforced tends to weaken. Now, why that's important for those of us who provide alcohol and substance use treatment is because the substances in and of themselves initially tend to be reinforcing. There is a, there is a feel good level to what the person experiences when they take in a substance. And then down the line, it is reinforcing because it takes away bad feelings. So substances have very strong reinforcement tendencies. And so it's important that we recognize people continue to use substances even in the light of them having negative effects on their lives because there is an immediate and instant reinforcement. Social learning theory, the name that's usually um, associated with that is Bandura. And basically there, the, the idea is that behavior is formed in a reciprocal manner. So we influence our environment and then our environment influences us, which makes us think and behave in a certain way, which leads to the environment responding to us in a certain way. So it's this idea that it's not just all what goes on internally and that it is important to recognize how the environment is affecting us and how we may be infecting our environment. Now, one of the things that's very important about the community reinforcement approach is that it was not based on any theory of moral or spiritual fortitude. And that is not to suggest that models that may have that as their basis are bad. It's just that this is different. This was very much based in psychological theory. So what is the overarching goal of CRA? According to Hunt and Nate Azrin, who is the name most often associated with this as its founding father, it is to arrange the vocational, family, and social reinforcers of the individuals who's using a substance such that a timeout from these reinforcers will occur if he or she begins to use. 
it's important when you hear much of the early quote by Nate Azrin that he's referring to he's in part, it was normed initially on male alcohol abusers. So it's not about anything gender specific. It's just an artifact of when the original studies took place. So what does that mean? Well, that basically means our job as the therapist is to build an environment in which we support non-using behaviors more than using behaviors. So Bob Myers, who was one of the later uh, refiners of this particular model, will often say what we're doing is not rocket science, but it's difficult to do. So how you change a person's environment can happen on many levels. And that's really our task as the therapist is to work with both the substance user and those people who are significant to him or her so that we can start building a reinforcement schedule that says you're going to get more pleasure out of not using than using. <clears throat> so if you look at it, it, it really is a comprehensive behavioral treatment um, for, for individuals with substance use or disorders. I will say that over time, uh, CRA has been applied more recently to other aberrant behaviors with some real success, particularly other behaviors that fall into a chronic health model, because that is how substance use disorders are perceived here, is it's a chronic health condition. Again, emphasis is on changing the environmental contingencies so that non-using behaviors are rewarded more than using behaviors and that the client then has motivation to make healthier lifestyle changes. Um, as I said in the last one, the very first study was done with an inpatient male alcohol abusing population in the early 1970s. Since that time, there have been multiple studies across the nation, actually across the world. Um, many of the manuals for CRA and ACRA are translated into other languages and consistently, regardless of location or type of substance being used or population being studied, we see very positive outcomes. Um, we have used it with multiple substance use disorders. We have used it in inpatient populations. We've used it in outpatient populations. The particular study I was on, like I said, was the first to use CRA in the treatment of homeless substance users. We've used CRA plus a voucher system, and we have uh, used it very successfully with adolescent populations. ACRA, which we'll talk about briefly at the end of this presentation, um, it was normed here in Albuquerque with a homeless population who was using cannabis, and it is now considered a um, best practice according to SAMHSA. The original book on uh, the community reinforcement was published in the 1990s. It's by Robert J. Myers and Jane Ellen Smith. Uh, Dr. Smith continues to be a professor of psychology at UNM and uh, Bob Myers is now a professor emeritus from that department, but continues to lecture widely and including through an institute that is here in Albuquerque. So you definitely can find more intensive community reinforcement trainings uh, fairly easily. And especially now in the time of COVID, you don't even have to travel for them, sadly. So how does it work? So CRA assumes that there are multiple things in a person's environment that have an impact on both sober behavior and substance use. What is important is to recognize that a lot of the elements that impact behaviors may not be done in a purposeful way. So one of the things that we do oftentimes when we're working with the loved ones of substance users is we help them understand how some of the choices that they're making in actuality 
have the potential to reinforce the very behaviors that they don't want to reinforce. And so helping people understand that it's not about them being bad or good, but just utilizing interaction styles and making choices can impact another person's behavior without any judgment on the part of an individual either toward him or herself or the other individual. Again, it blends an operant model with social systems. So again, it's all about what does the environment look like and are we consistently reinforcing sober behavior more than we are reinforcing use behavior. And if we have a chance at the end of the session, I'll talk briefly, especially with adolescents, how oftentimes we inadvertently spend more time and attention with that adolescent in response to the substance use than was happening prior to the time and attention we paid to that adolescent before they started using. So the goals of CRA are first, we want to eliminate the positive reinforcement for engaging in the substance use behavior. Now, some people go, well, I don't, I don't reinforce using substances. But oftentimes when we're working with concerned significant others, one of the things we'll say is, if your wife is too hungover to go to work, what do you do? And the response oftentimes is, well, then I call in for them because I don't want them to get in trouble. And so while there are reasons that you may not want your spouse to get in trouble, not get in trouble um, at their work because you would like them to keep their job, by giving that individual an out and taking responsibility for mitigating the impact of their use the night before actually is reinforcing the substance use in a way that probably was never intended. The other thing is we encourage people to increase the reinforcement for sober behaviors. Sometimes that's really hard for loved ones to do because they don't trust it. He's just going to relapse anyway. Why should I be nice to him? He's done nothing but cause me trouble, right? We hear these kinds of things from our, from our patients, significant others all the time. And so that takes some working with, if you will, because both of those are legitimate, the anger and the frustration and the weariness about long-term interaction with a substance user and simultaneously, okay, we're going to try to get the substance user to behave differently to his environment. Can you help us by changing your behavior with the substance use? Essentially, the goal of CRA is to make sober living more rewarding than the use of substances. That's not so easy because oftentimes the reinforcement for non-using behavior takes longer than the immediate reward of getting high or um, drinking alcohol, whatever your particular substance happens to be. CRA has several consistent components across all applications. The first one is what's called a functional analysis of substance use. And basically, all that does is it takes all judgment out of looking at why someone uses and just says, okay, where, when, with whom are you using? What do you get out of it on a positive note? And then what are the long-term consequences of that? And the reason that that's so important is because we need to find out the function of the substance for that particular individual in order to find other ways to meet that particular need. It is on an individualized basis. The component is the same across patients, but what the treatment specificity looks like really is tailored to the struggles and, that that individual is facing. 
<clears throat> we also have a functional analysis of non-use behavior. And that looks very similar to the first one, except oftentimes for a non-use behavior, the immediate reward, the immediate consequences are negative. And that's especially true if we're trying to get um, work with a client to try some pro-social behavior that they may have done in the past, but gotten out of the habit of, have some initial anxiety, don't feel very comfortable, not sure where they should access this particular activity. Those are all short-term negative consequences, but the long-term consequence of that behavior tends to be in line with the very thing we are trying to do with the CRA approach. Another thing that we do is we identify what's called a sobriety sample. And this is really important because while for many, many people, the goal of treatment is abstinence, this is very much an abstinence as the long-term goal model. We consider any movement, any reduction in use, any decrease in negative consequences of use to be a movement in the right direction. And oftentimes, if you are working with an individual who has ambivalence to say to them, you have to stop drinking, you can never have another drink in your life, they'll go, bye, right? They don't want to hear that. And so what you say instead is, you know, I'm wondering what it would be like if we just tried going without alcohol for, I don't know, three, six months. Um, and there's a particular protocol that you do when introducing this, um, which we don't have time to get into today, but can be very, very effective. Because you're not saying to someone, you can never drink again. You're just saying, well, you know, you say that your substances really aren't causing you any problems. I'm just wondering if we could look at this for a few months and see if that really holds true. Because then you're not trying to convince them that it does, they ultimately will see the changes that occur with a significant reduction or, or abstinence for a brief period. Um, medication assisted treatment within CRA is very, very common. It was one of the first studies, it was one of the first models to include in early studies the use of an abuse, which was all we had for alcohol disorders at the time but we have really good data of the utilization of opiate replacement disorders with a CRA model approach. Um, there is a specific way that CRA does a treatment plan, which I'll touch on here in a moment. Behavioral skills training are really the cornerstone of this approach. The belief that the therapist needs to take into the session with the patient is that oftentimes people choose to use drugs and alcohol because they don't know how else to get what they need from that, whether it's relaxation or pain um, assuaging or enhanced social capacity, whatever it is. And so to ask someone to give that up without teaching them other skills that can lead to that same outcome really does set them up for relapse. Uh, job skills training are very much a part of this. Everyone needs a purpose. And so it may not be a paid for position, but it, 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 people, need, people need work and they need important activity. Social and recreational counseling, that sounds odd. I really have to teach somebody how to recreate that oftentimes that is the case, especially if most of their social and recreational activity has been associated with the substance use. So Raina, I see it's already 1225. Can I have till 1235? Okay, great. Um, and finally, uh, the last component of, well, there's two, the la uh, relapse prevention. So we talk a lot about preventing relapses and how to mitigate relapses if they do occur. And finally, really looking at how we use family and concern significant others um, with regard to helping us help the patient move forward differently. One of the things that I like about community reinforcement 
is that it is very flexible, it's menu based, and it is client paced. So while there are very good studies that show something as brief as a 10 to 12 session application of this can be quite effective. If somebody is getting better faster, we don't have to keep them for the whole 12. And if they need 16, we can do that as well. We use the resources that the patient has to begin with, and then we build on that. So again, there are key components to all of this in every application, but how those components are applied very much is dependent on the individual that we're treating. Very quickly, I just want to show you briefly what the functional analysis looks like. Again, we're looking at what is outside of you that triggers you to use, what is inside you that triggers you to use, what does use look like for you, and then with the substance use behavior, what are the short-term consequences that are rewarding, and what are the long-term consequences that are dam damaging to you. Um, for the pro-social behavior, the, very similar, it's just that the last two columns are switched. What are the not so good things about the short term, not so good things. Let's say I've decided I'm gonna get back into shape and I'm gonna start running again when I quit drinking. Well, the first time I do it, my body aches, I can't breathe, I'm reminded of how old and out of shape I am. But then you go to the long-term consequences, which are the good things and the rewards that allow you to move forward. Uh, again, sobriety sampling, get the client to agree to a time limited sobriety and then really work with them and their significant others on what that will look like. Uh, Matt, again with NCRA, I know several of you are based at um, Matt centers. Disulfiram use originally was part of CRA very early on. We have now incorporated other medications. Dr. Jacobson can probably speak to that more eloquently than I. Um, for alcohol, and then certainly um, we have CRA in combination with methadone maintenance. We have seen not only do we see a reduction in opiate use, but other drugs as well. We see an improvement in the patient's legal status, less psychiatric symptoms, and improved vocational and social functioning. Um, I'm just going to go over this very, very briefly, many of us are in institutions that have treatment plans that are mandated in their format by an accrediting body under whose auspices we work. But for CRA, the treatment plan really is based on two things. We start out by just asking clients to rate themselves on how happy they are in these various um, social areas and interpersonal and intrapersonal areas. And then what we do is we use that information to identify ways that we can move them from a lower score in these areas to a higher score in these areas. And that is what feeds directly into the goals of counseling sheet. So maybe the goal of a job or education is I would like to go back to school. So the intervention initially would be, well, then I need to contact the local community college and see what is required for me to get enrolled. You always give a time frame. This is very much behaviorally based. If you leave it, leave it to sort of nebulousness, nothing happens. So I really like this. I appreciate for those of us who have some time, I mean, some treatment plan concerns constraints. We may have to massage this language a little bit in order to fit into something that SOTA or Joint Commission or whomever it finds appropriate. But the key really is how happy am I not just with my drug and alcohol use, but in all areas of life. The other reason that I like this so much as approach is it really reminds the individuals with whom we're working that we are not treating their substance use, we're treating them. We're treating the whole person and that all aspects of their life are important to their overall health and well-being, not just the stopping of the alcohol or the drug abuse.
I mentioned before that um, there are various types of skills training that are involved. Communication skills are another cornerstone for us. Oftentimes that is the skill that has been most disrupted by substance use behavior. And so if we can help the individual be able to better communicate, not only with others, but actually with him or herself, being available, being able to understand and have the availability of their own emotions and thoughts so that they can convey those to other people becomes very, very important. Um, that's a problem solving strategy. Again, one of my favorite is actually role playing with individuals on how to, on Nancy Reagan was right, kind of in just say no, but oftentimes we need practice in learning how to do that. Uh, job skills too, the, all of this, all of this is available in more detail in the book that I showed you by Myers and Smith, um, published in 1995 social and recreational counseling. Again, if everything you do involves drugs or alcohol, then you actually have to help the patient find other things to do that will allow them to recreate, to recuperate, and to be social in a way that doesn't involve substances. Relapse prevention, there's actually a functional analysis that can happen if a relapse has occurred. Again, so there's no shame involved in having a slip or a relapse. It's just information. What didn't we plan for? How can we plan differently the next time? Uh, relationship counseling is an integral part. I won't get into that. The move to an adolescent model of this happened again, I said, in the early, in the early 2000s with a program for uh, homeless youth who were abusing cannabis. What, you know, what we know about ACRA is it's very similar to community reinforcement approach, particularly with regard to problem solving and social skills training, because in adolescence, those oftentimes haven't formed anyway. Uh, the other thing that we do is we actually incorporate with each session, I mean with each patient, several sessions, including family and caregivers. In an adult version of CRA, it's, it's optimal to include what we call concerned significant others, but it's not mandated for an adolescent approach. The utilization of concerned significant others has to be a part of the treatment. Uh, again, sessions with clients have very specific templates and sessions with the caregivers also um, fairly structured. But again, how that structure is applied is based on the patient and the family. The current, the model that is utilized for the adolescent cannabis use protocol is actually 10 individual sessions with an additional four sessions with a caregiver. You can see the structure of those um, on the slide. As I said, that particular manual is available for free for download um, from the SAMHSA website as far as a best practice. 